Have you ever played peekaboo with an infant? Hands over your eyes, move one hand, then the other, and then it's peekaboo. Done right, and you, there are sure to be peals of laughter. If you're particularly lucky, you might even prompt an early word like, again, peekaboo. Even before we speak, we humans like to play games. This does not make us unique. All mammals do it. I've been reminded of this repeatedly in my house by our cats. A few months ago, Sade brought home a little black and white tuxedo kitten. We named him Bagel. He's a companion to Biscuit, the tuxedo cat Ace and I brought with us from Massachusetts. Biscuit and Bagel spend a lot of time playing. I've named some of their games. They play King of the Mountain. This is when one of the cats gets on top of something, usually a cardboard box or a chair, and dares the other one to push him off. Then there's Sumo. Now this can only take place in one particular spot in the house, a rug that lies next to a blue couch. And the winner is the cat that succeeds in pushing the other cat off the rug and under the couch. <laughs> Predator and prey is probably their favorite team sport. It involves our dog, Afro, and she's usually an unwitting player. The cats hide behind a couch or a corner or someplace they think that she cannot see them. When she walks by, they jump out, they take a swat, she marches on. I think that they imagine themselves to be lions, and I suspect that they picture poor Afro as a gazelle or something. She just ignores their game. Now, I don't speak cat, though admittedly I understand a bit of purr, and I have no idea what Biscuit and Bagel call their games. Maybe they have complicated names and well-thought-out rules that are rigorously spelled out in cat pheromones. Perhaps there's even some sort of detailed point system a successful bop on the dog's flank is worth 10 points. A daring tap on her nose is worth 20, and so forth. But truthfully, I don't know. In my labeling of cat games, I've hinted at a central aspect of human playfulness, the imagination. People are always dreaming are always visioning things, taught the writer Covington Hall. Music and poetry, sculpture and painting and architecture was all but a dream once, he continued. People are always dreaming, always visioning things. This program year, we've organized our major sermon series around the power of the imagination. It's titled Future Visions, Future Selves, and once a month between now and June, we're going to explore some aspect of the future. This autumn, we focus on the future of society. It's a presidential election year, so it's a good time for it. We have 50 days, after all, until the votes start getting counted. During that time, the two major party candidates and their acolytes will be trying to get to the rest of us to imagine what the country and the world will look like under their leadership. In this exercise, they'll be joined by innumerable pundits, academics, community organizers, minor party candidates, uh, ordinary voters, and let's face it, just about everybody else. Everyone will be joining together in a game of imagination with enormous consequences. A game of imagination. With that phrase, I share one of the central theses of this sermon series, 
Society, I suggest, is nothing more than a vastly complicated game that we're all playing together. Almost everything was but a dream once. This congregation, after all, began in the collective imagination of its founders. Without their vision, you would not be here, nor would I, nor would you be watching online this Sunday the opportunity to sing a song together, to listen to Dr. Rock and Chloe, to hear me pontificate on peekaboo and cats and the power of dreams, or to have some coffee and conversation after the service all require vision. The United States is a political idea or a contest over political ideas. It's not a geographic reality that existed in nature or a human kinship group. The same can be said for the state of Texas. The Constitution can be thought of the foundational rules of the game that we call the United States. Congress is always modifying those rules. The executive branch and the judiciary are forever interpreting them. If you've ever been to court, then I suspect that you've seen the game laid bare. One side, the plaintiff, contests with the other, the defendant. The judge interprets the law, the rules for play. The jury picks the winner. The attorneys involved each try to convince the jurors that their imaginative interpretation of stories, it gets called testimony, and objects, they call them evidence, is the correct one. Guilty, one side played the game well. Not guilty, the other side did better. It's easy to forget that law and politics are both games. It's hard to remember that the Constitution, the United States, and the, text, the state of Texas all began as acts of imagination. It's even harder to remember that we only sustain them through our collective imagination. If enough people stopped imagining that they lived in a country called the United States, then it would cease to exist. History ha teaches us this. Such things have happened many times before. In fact, many of the people who have lived on this land have imagined themselves to be part of a six different nations at some point, the so-called Six Flags over Texas. France, Spain, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the United States, the Confederacy, the United States again. The land didn't change. The people were often the same, but each change, each shift was a shift to a different set of rules, a different kind of game. And even this description fail, represents a failure of imagination, a misnaming of a game being played. In recent years, more and more historians have come to argue that much of Texas was not even part of Texas until sometime after the Civil War. Up until the 1870s, most people of European descent who lived in the western part of the state did not pay taxes primarily to the state of Texas or the federal or confederate governments. They paid their taxes, which get called in your history books tribute, to the Comanche Empire. Politics is a game in which we imagine the future. In it we ask, what is my place in this society? What are society's obligations to me? What are mine to it? Who is part of it and who is not? Who sets the rules of the game? How do they change? How are they enforced? When I ask these questions, can you unleash your wildest political imagination? If the game of politics was to begin again, how would you create it with diff or would you create it with different rules? with different outcomes. Let's pause here for a moment so you can imagine. Be realistic, 
demand the impossible. The old political slogan goes. And this autumn, we plan to invite you to do something with your vision for the future. We'll be extending an invitation during some of our services, and we'll be inviting you to play with your imagination during our climate revival at the end of the month in response to the devastation that Dr. Rock sung so eloquently about in her renditions of Marvin Gaye's Mercy, Mercy Me and What's Going On, in response to the gathering climate crisis, in response to the despair that so many of us feel oil wasted upon the ocean and upon our seas, fish full of mercury, will encourage you to draw a positive portrait of what the world might look like in 2050. Then in early October, we'll be taking part in Texas Impact's Vitas Robata's Stolen Lives Project. We'll be decorating our campus with t-shirts bearing the names of people who have lost their lives due to gun violence here in Harris County. You can help make one of the t-shirts after the service. Through the project, we will ask, can we dream of a world or even just a city where not one more person loses their life at the end of a barrel of a gun. Through all, all that time, we will, of course, be encouraging everyone to vote in the presidential election. The last day to register, by the way, is October 7th. This year, we've set the goal of 100% participation from the members who, and friends of First Unitarian Universalist who are eligible to vote. Can you help us make that goal? In the last presidential election, only 80% of eligible members voted. In the 2024 primary election, it was only 60%. And I challenge us to do better. So where's the amen corner for that? Come on. <laughs> if you want to be part of that effort, you can be, join the voting justice team you heard a bit about it earlier in the service, and they're in Channing Hall each Sunday. There's also opportunities to block walk as we try to motivate our neighbors to vote. And you can make their job easier by having a voting plan and going to the polls. Can we have 100% of our members and friends vote? Yes. Yes. I'm going to be realistic and demand the possible, and it sounds like you are too. That's supposed to be another amen, come on. <laughs> Organizing alone is not sufficient to sustain us. As we pound the pavement register, voters increase turnout and work to end gun, gun violence, we still have to find a space for stillness. The stillness, the light within, reminds us that we are all somebody. We are each nestled in, connected to all being. Let nothing trouble you. Let nothing scare you. All is fleeting. God alone is unchanging. Patience, everything obtains. Who possesses God, nothing wants. God alone suffices. Teresa of Avellola's prayer is beautiful. It is calming. Such quietism found in many of the world's traditions has a place within our sanctuary and within Unitarian Universalism. It is one reason why we have stillness in each service. And I promise that we will be making space for such contemplation this autumn, even as we have calls to action. But even as we do, I hope that you will join with me, the voting justice team, and others in the congregation in a different kind of religious act. Religion, as I have said in the past, is what binds us together. And the game of politics is something that binds all of us together. It's like the civil rights organizer Fannie Lou Hamer used to say, baby, what we eat is politics. This evening, this autumn, I'll be encouraging us to follow her lead and the lead of those like S Senator Raphael Warnock, who understand political engagement as a religious act. He likes to say, a vote is a kind of prayer for the kind of world 
we desire for ourselves and for our children. Our prayers are stronger when we pray together. He often continues. And this autumn we'll be doing a lot of praying together. But as the days go short, we'll make a shift from visions for the future to contemplating the future of ourselves. Religion, after all, has long been tilted towards this task. It is as Unitarian Universalist theologian Forrest Church has written, religion is our human response to being alive and having to die. When we discover we must die, we question what life means. That search for meaning, that acknowledgement of our own human finitude in midst of the seemingly infinite universe will be our particular focus for the winter. Meaning making, of course, is always central to what we do. Christine Robinson, another Unitarian Universalist minister, is helpful on this point. She reminds us that people come into our sanctuary to quench a thirst find meaningfulness, to connect with mystery, to deepen our souls. We'll pursue that deepening December, January, and February with services focused on that, those most difficult of subjects, religious trauma and death. These can be heavy. They trouble our imagination. They are necessary for meaning-making. It's like that favorite poem of Mary Oliver's ends. Doesn't everything die at last? Tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild, precious life. What is your plan for your one wild, precious life? I know from my conversations with many of you that this question brings you to Unitarian Universalism. Often the arcs of your journeys share similar trajectories. You come here because you found the answers offered elsewhere to be dispiriting. The story you learned about the divine, the way the story you were told about death, the meaning you were given no longer made sense. You were filled with doubt, troubled by the great cloud of the unknowing, And so one Sunday you found yourself in our sanctuary thirsting for, well, thirsting for something. Our prayers are stronger when we pray together. We quench our thirst better when we seek together. We quench our thirst better in this community where we seek the life of the Spirit free from religious dogma. Quenching that thirst sometimes requires acknowledging what happened earlier. Before your cup can run over, sometimes you have to understand why it was empty in the first place. So in December, we'll tend to a subject, subject central to so many of our lives, religious trauma. There are so many people in this community who have been hurt by religion. Maybe they've been told that there was something wrong with them for loving whom they love. Perhaps they've been shamed for being who they are. Might be that they've been discouraged from casting questions into the deep. Here we offer a different message. Here we widen love circle by saying whomever you are, whomever you love, whatever your questions, you are welcome here. Bring your whole self, bring your questions. Imagine a religion where you can bring the fullness of yourself the breadth of your curiosity, the depth of your dreams. Can you imagine such a religion? Can we imagine a religion together? Religious community, after all, is just another game that we play. An exploration of religious trauma helps uncover some of the hidden rules that haunt our collective game. The hidden rules that we each bring. Sometimes I like to play a game called Name the Divine. There are hidden rules in it, and they often become palpable when we play. But God is not a symbol for that which is, or God is a symbol for that which is greater than all and yet resides within each. 
God is not something that can be described. God might not even be. But humans have been trying to unname the unnameable for as long as there has been a record of human thought. Can you think of an image of God that has been unhelpful on your own spiritual journey? Tending to religious trauma can help us to describe the hidden rules that are stifling our spiritual journey. Once we know those rules, we can let them go. Can you recall that image of an oppressive deity for just a second? Hold it in your mind, and then I invite you to cast it out. Just try it. Just say, I cast out. Let's try it. I cast out uh, fear. I cast out hate. When we cast out the hidden rules from religious trauma, we are, as the Unitarian Universalist minister Marilyn Sewell has said, threatened with resurrection. We discover that we might just experience what I call the resurrection of the living and wake up to the beauty and wonder and complexity of the world as it is. We might open ourselves to, in her words, break through into a new way, a new direction. A new way, a new direction. As spring comes, as the days lengthen and light returns to the world, we will leave the wintry world of death and trauma behind. In celebration of the coming bright of summer, we'll finish our sermon series, Future Visions, Future Selves, with an invitation to play some of the most enjoyable games, imagining the future of humanity. And here religion orients us again. For every religion encourages us to imagine the future. Some encourage ourselves imagine escaping from or leaving history. And such narratives, God or a constellation of deities, ends the earthly all of existence, ends human history, ends human futures, and brings about a forever enduring reign of peace. Other religions encourage us to change the future ourselves. A vote is a kind of prayer. We have the collective power, the collective agency, the collective imagine to dream in new ways of being into existence. A third set of religions imagines that there will be no change in the future. The world is as it is. It is up to us to accept it to find our place within it. We cannot change it no matter how hard we try. With these religious frameworks before us, we will explore how and if humanity is changing and how humanity might change. Does humanity have a future amongst the stars? Are we alone in the universe? Are there extraterrestrials? How is artificial intelligence challenging what it means to be human? All of these questions have the profound possibility of shifting what it means to be religious. They might each open up new pathways for spirituality. Religion is another game we play together. How do you imagine the future of our society? How do you imagine your future life? How do you imagine the future of humanity? We'll explore these questions together this year as we play the spirit-filled, loving, imaginative game we call the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston. If you're a visitor, I hope that you will join us in our beautiful game. And if you're a member or a longtime friend, I hope you'll find this year uplifting, deepening, and motivating. Please get out and vote. But before we close, we return for a moment to the subject of my cats. Because, let's face it, you always knew it was going to come back to them. (laughs) The wonderful thing about watching them with their games of King of the Mountain, Sumo, and Predator and Prey is that they remind us that to be alive is to play. And to build community together is an act of play. One of Unitarian Universalism's strengths is that we put this truth at the center of our religious experience. 
we say that we are a non-credo religious community. We do not take the rules of the game as fixed. Every person, every generation, in every hour and in every day has the opportunity to imagine them anew. One, two, three, peekaboo. You try it. One, two, three, peekaboo. What did you see when you closed your eyes? And when you opened them, what was before you? Shall we join together in a game of imagining, of dreaming, of building, of creating together future visions and future selves in the hopes that we shall imagine, shall dream, build, and create together? I invite the congregation to say, Amen.